Hi, listeners. This is Chris Batts, your host of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. Today's episode, I'm speaking with the CEO of an AmLaw 200 law firm and his perspective on client trends, procuring legal services, and how his firm is designing solution portfolios for these clients. We also discussed his advice for aspiring managing partners, why he's watching the new competition with a close eye, and what he's seeing in the lateral marketplace. Just remember, the PDF transcript of this audio is available to download. Go to linegrouprecruiting.com forward slash podcast. As many of you know, we interview corporate defense, law firm leaders, partners, general counsels, and legal consultants. You are listening to episode number 19 of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. Broadcasting from Kansas City, this is the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. In each episode, you'll receive actionable ideas and hear personal leadership stories of the top corporate defense law firms from around the United States. Enjoy a front row seat with law firm leaders, their partners, and legal consultants as we discuss life and leadership. Welcome to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Batts with The Line Group. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Eric Gustafsson, CEO of LeClaire Ryan. Being based in Virginia, Eric oversees about 330 attorneys and 600 employees in 25 offices across the United States. Prior, he was the head of the firm's litigation department. As a practicing attorney, he counsels the senior leadership at his clients about operations, governance, growth, and risk management. He is also currently a member of the executive committee of U.S. Law Network and has served in several roles in the organization. Eric received his JD from the Georgetown University Law Center. Welcome, Eric, to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks, Chris. I really uh, appreciate the opportunity. Look forward to talking to you about some of the topics going on, uh, both in my head and in the industry. Very good. Well, and I, just in our prior conversations, there's always things that pop out that I'd love to emphasize. And so I, I'd love to hear your perspective on what you're seeing in clients and how they are procuring legal services today. Great. Thanks, Chris. A, a couple different things, and this has been an evolution that I have seen uh, over the last couple of years, but it's particularly timely, I think, to talk about today. Uh, some of the listeners to the podcast may have seen in the last few days the Georgetown University Law Center, uh, Thomson Reuters State of the Profession report um, in some of the commentary from American Lawyer Media and others around that. And it really emphasized what is becoming a very clear and evident shift in how clients are looking at procuring and managing their expectations around outside legal services and, and in fact, their, their in-house function. And uh, I'll break it down in a couple of ways, but the two overriding themes that you see developing are really a change from what I would say, speaking as someone who's been practicing for a long time, you know, this is still very much a relationship business, but rather than being a relationship business uh, founded only on uh, having got, gotten to know one another through, you know, a shared experience at a law firm or law school, uh, or through an organization like the ABA or a local bar association. Instead, that relationship increasingly is uh, both more dynamic with more people in it, such as a CEO or a CFO of a client, or perhaps a procurement officer. So, you know, a change in the set of roles that are determining uh, how should we outsource our legal work, uh, who should be in that mix. I think one of the other themes is uh, very much looking at data. So rather than just how do you feel about whether we're getting good legal services, do you feel like we're getting good value? Uh, there's a lot more data involved in the equation. I also think as you look at, and um, I noticed, for example, one of the largest international financial institutions in the U.S. Uh, just had a change, announced a change in its general counsel role where the new general counsel is someone in their mid-40s, you know, you're beginning to see the rise of both Gen X, Gen Y, um, and then increasingly millennial consumers of legal services from the corporate perspective. Uh, and they bring a very different understanding and feel for both data and technology to the, to the equation. And then finally, I think, you know, who knew, uh, looking at this 10 or 15 years ago, uh, or when I was graduating from law school in, in the early 90s, that rather than looking at the spectrum of legal services divided between in-house counsel and uh, outside law firms, 
that you'd have uh, a rise, particularly in the last five years, five to 10 years, of what many commentators are referring to as new law. And that is non-law firms that are providing services, whether they're in-house services under the auspices of a general counsel or whether they are outsourced services supporting the function of the outside counsel. But um, in any of the sorts of reports and demographics that you look at in the industry, the statistics, that's the fastest growing segment of uh, the legal services marketplace. Um, and those might be um, large companies like Integrion. They may be smaller entities, you know, larger companies, including Integrion, Thomson Reuters, uh, LexisNexis, which have uh, multiple sets of services that uh, provide alternatives to traditional either outsourcing or insourcing to lawyers, although those services may be delivered in those uh, companies by lawyers. And then you'd also see the nature of technology and the sophistication of technology affecting uh, the efficiency with which the services can be delivered or the amount of leverage that either an outside lawyer or an in-house lawyer can use to deliver that uh, service that ultimately they, they want to their client, whether their client's an internal consumer uh, or, in the case of the law firm, an external consumer. So very long-winded, complicated answer. Uh, Chris, I don't know uh, what, what might be a good way to break that down. A lot of different themes in that. Yeah. So I guess my next question would be is, how are you responding to that? How is LeClaire Ryan responding to the shifts and changes? So a couple different ways. One of which is increasingly part of my role as the CEO is meeting with our clients and uh, developing conversations with clients about uh, what I would refer to as portfolios of legal services whether that is uh, not just being on an approved panel or a list to be able to do work, but really having a thoughtful discussion about uh, what's keeping uh, the general counsel or the CEO or the CFO awake at night from a risk management perspective, but also an expense perspective, and looking to repurpose and redesign how that solution is delivered. And that sounds very 100,000-foot uh, speak, but it it kind of distills down to a couple of different key things. One, identifying where there are pockets of work uh, that clients would like to do uh, more predictively in terms of their cost um, at an equal or even better result, more predictive result. So again, this isn't about uh, simply discounting rates uh, or uh, doing the services for less because the fundamental value promise to the client is that you need to do those services at least as well as, but but really better than the services have been provided before in a more thoughtful and holistic fashion. Now, not everything lends itself to that, um, but for clients particularly that have uh, recurrent legal needs in volume or uh, simple recurrent legal needs as a result of the operation of their business, whether it's regulatory compliance, uh, whether it's analysis of data privacy uh, or just operational, uh, breaking that down into a predictive uh, way and really asking them the question, you know, what are the main drivers that you want? So, for example, uh, we've done project, projects with a number of our clients uh, for several years now where uh, rather than just saying, you know, here's an alternative fee model uh, and what I like to describe in the analogy is the box. You know, here's the box we'd like to sell you. It's, it really is about here's the process and here's the conversation and it starts with what are the client's goals and then you design the box that the client wants. The advantage for the law firm in that is rather than, uh, rather than what's happened historically where you might get, in, you know, first you might get on the approved list to do work. Uh, or, or you simply might take over work, or you might, you know, have founded or developed a company, um, and you are growing. Uh, and as legal needs come and go, you're moving those legal needs to the right people, and it's keeping them incrementally busy or less busy, or you know, it's shifting work, and you identify new opportunity. Instead, this allows you to take a much more comprehensive approach, including designing where. Um, you know, a technology solution might create more efficiency or a technology solution might be, uh, be able to create a better collaborative environment. Uh, so, you know, are you sharing data rather than regurgitating data and sending it by FedEx or by email? 
You know, is there a shared online portal? Uh, or, you know, what are the steps to be able to do the work and how can you take a certain number of those steps out while preserving the quality and predictive nature of the result, but doing it more efficiently? And, you know, I would argue that one of the opportunities in this uh, is that rather than worrying about how many hours you're going to fill on someone's plate, the more that you can look at a portfolio approach, the more you can operate like almost any other business in the United States, including professional services businesses, which is a better understanding of your talent and where your talent will have the highest and best use, coupled with the predictive nature of what your revenue is likely to be. So uh, for those of you who have ever had the experience of either having to give a personal budget of what you think you're going to produce in the coming year uh, as part of either your compensation process or part of your annual review process, or for those of you in, in law firm leadership who have had to estimate how busy do you think we're going to be in the coming year, well, if, you know, if 99% of your work is essentially time and materials contracts, meaning all billable hour work, you know, the hope is that whatever you did next year, you're going to be able to, to improve on your rates, you know, one to five percent. And if, again, if you look at the data on AMLA 100 and AMLA 200 firms that comes out, uh, there's a little bit of a bifurcation certainly now between, uh, AMLA 50 firms and those coming after the AMLA 50. But, you know, it's still a bet and it's a bet on how busy do we think our client demand is going to be. You know, how well do we think our colleagues are going to react to finding more work? Uh, because most firms, um, including ours, the vast majority of the work is still generated by individual colleagues uh, maintaining and developing great interpersonal relationships and delivering excellent client service. However, what I see as part of a transition is um, in almost every other professional services business uh, or other things like law, software contract development, uh, consulting services, those kind of things, the predictive nature of those contracts, which tend not to be time and materials contracts, uh, really lend themselves to longer-term thinking, driving value, predictability for the firm itself in its financial performance, and not the fortuity of you know, who happens to be at the firm, whether they have a better year than the year they did before, and when you can bring that institutional relationship in, the, in all of the value that all of your team members have into an aggregate with a client, not only is it uh, driving a better relationship and a better understanding of that client's needs, their business, their goals, um, but you actually find the teamwork across practices and across offices really increases. So, uh, again, I apologize that that's a long answer, uh, but, but hopefully there's some nuggets in that. Uh, about how we tackle it, one of which is, uh, you know, we have industry teams, we have practice area teams, we have specific client teams. Uh, our practice area teams are across office. Our client teams are across offices and across practices. Our industry teams are across practices and across offices as well. And it's trying to bring that sum total of knowledge to bear on providing solutions to our clients. Um, but uh, from an organizational basis, that's where I think it starts from a philosophical basis. It's all driven by how can we do better work for our clients and deliver better results. Let me pivot, Eric, to another question. And I think you've done very well to explain kind of what you're seeing with clients and how you guys are responding. And this actually might complement or dovetail what you just shared, but what's what's keeping you up at night right now as the CEO of a firm um, with nearly a thousand miles to feed, if you may, in the short term and let's say the midterm, because the long term is kind of hard to predict for law firms in the same regard. What's keeping you up at night? Sure. So let me, uh, and, and you're exactly right. First of all, what keeps me up at night uh, is my responsibility to my partners and my colleagues um, in making sure that, that everyone is engaged, that there's the opportunity uh, that they want. And it's both, you know, the thing you think about before you go to go to sleep every night. And, uh, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, the first thing I do in the morning, uh, because we, you know, we have clients around the world, uh, we operate, uh, we have offices in, in three time zones. Uh, so the first thing I do in the morning uh, after I've uh, cleared my head for a couple minutes is I look to see, you know, what are the 50 emails that came in while I was sleeping? 
Um, and here are the things that sort of uh, here are the things that I'm focused on. Uh, in the short run, uh, in the short run, there are monumental changes taking place in how clients are procuring services, what their expectations around the delivery of those services are. Uh, you know, the hunt for talent, uh, both talent that has uh, relationships as well as talent that fits client needs. And so in the, you know, in the short run, uh, it's very much about, uh, you know, how are we, how are we doing on our budget? How are we doing on revenue? Do we have the right mix of talent? Uh, where are the, the places that we can add increased depth to bring greater value or increased reach? Um, so it's those operational day to day things. And the biggest challenge that I see overall, um, is the, is the, um, marketplace challenge. Uh, and how it's impacting folks. And, and again, you know, the data is pretty clear about how quickly that's changing. Um, in the longer range, in the, you know, let's call it the, the two to five year range, um, uh, you know, again, I'll come back to what I see as the marketplace challenges. So they're not unique to, to our firm in particular. Uh, you know, I, I have a little bit of a background in uh, sailing and, and spending a lot of time. And so, you know, if you, and I'll draw a bad analogy, but, uh, you know, if you look at the industry as, as you know, sort of the sea and, and there are uh, law firms and non-law firms and in-house clients, and they're all sort of on that sea together. And, you know, you have a storm brewing. Things are changing. And the question is, are you making the right decisions to take advantage of the strength of the increasing winds in trying to get where you're going? Have you charted the right course, uh, you know, or are you merely being buffeted by them and staying in place and hoping that you're going to survive that storm? And so uh, the biggest challenge I see in the next three to five years is the increased amount of competition uh, from non-law firms that look at the aggregated legal marketplace in the U.S., sometimes estimated to be over $500 billion um, in, in terms of the value driven to, to provide legal services. And that's an aggregate of in-house non-law or new law and law firms. So, you know, uh, $500 billion, um, at least is a number I've seen relatively recently. Um, and if you think about it, our challenges in a world increasingly dominated and influenced by technology, uh, where people are looking for ease of use and efficiency, there's no less legal work out there. We're, we are an increasingly regulated world, um, but how we solve those problems are increasingly influenced by things that require capital investment, changes in processes, changes in thinking. Um, and, and a lot of those are being driven by clients in particular now. But, you know, lawyers, I think the great part about being a lawyer and, and having a background and thinking about client problems and more importantly, delivering solutions is it's a real opportunity for us to be creative in doing that. But one of the challenges is a lot of the tools that are required to do that uh, involve capital expenditures, whether it's new systems, software, uh, non-lawyer personnel. Uh, whether they're around pricing or legal process management um, or optimization. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's a real change in the culture. And, um, you know, as, as someone who has a little bit of a background uh, from undergrad and in, in being a history major, uh, it's also about, um, you know, our, our profession, generally speaking, is wonderfully predictive. Uh, I, I sometimes joke that the difference, by and large, between the way law was practiced, uh, you know, 200 years ago and the way it's practiced now is that I have the advantage of having a networked digital quill at my desk, and I'm sure I use about 2.5% of its computing power, but, but man, it's the most elegant typewriter uh, <laughs> that I've got, and it draws in all this information from, from around the world. But again, uh, you know, I am uh, either old enough <laughs> uh, or young enough interestingly, that, you know, I can remember when we shifted to having network computers at the first firm that I worked at and, uh, you know, with a, a 24 baud modem and it took 20 minutes for a 15 page brief uh, to magically appear from uh, 
at the firm I was at had a Boston office and a DC office. Uh, but it took about 20 minutes for that 20, 15 to 25 page brief to magically appear on my system. But I still had an IBM selector two at my desk. And I am uh, uh, young enough uh, for some of my colleagues that when I was in high school, we were actually trained how to program in BASIC because uh, back then there was a theory that everyone was also going to you know, program their own computers to do interesting things. So it's an inter- interesting confluence not to be a baby boomer, not to be a millennial. <laughs> Well, it's, oh, how times have changed and <laughs> in kind of the midterm range, two to five years, you mentioned, so charting the right course with the storm brewing and you talked about that. Tell me a little bit about, um, you had mentioned earlier about, you know, the challenge of succession planning with changes in clients and changes in the right staffing of your firm. Sure. So a couple different things around that. I mean, one of which is, again, if you look at the industry um, and, and in fact, um, even if you're not a student in the industry, if you just pay attention to changes in state bar ethics rules, for example, I practice in Virginia, among other things, uh, Virginia last year changed one of its ethical rules around disability, uh, which historically is, has, has really kind of been taken to mean uh, dependency, uh, whether you know, drug or alcohol dependency as practicing under a disability. Um, and for the first time, uh, Virginia modified its ethical rules to really clarify that that includes um, sort of, uh, you know, what I'll, what I'll say is age-related uh, potential cognition um, uh, limitations and uh, the duty to supervise and analyze uh, colleagues who are uh, practicing at an increasingly older age. It, and it was interesting because one of the footnotes or, or notes to it uh, gave a gave a demographic, and uh, the majority of uh, practitioners, uh, at least in Virginia, were uh, I think were it was either over fifty five or or over sixty. And and again, if you look at um, uh, AML one hundred and two hundred metrics, the vast majority of equity partners in those firms are colleagues who are over the age of fifty five, and generally speaking. Uh, you know, we don't have mandatory retirement at our firm. Some firms either have mandatory deequitization or mandatory retirement. But, right. you know, overall, if you look at it, lawyers are practicing longer and longer, and a majority of partners in um, practice in some states and a majority of partners in law firms uh, are increasingly at um, an overall average age that's older than ever before. Um, and uh, generally speaking, our clients are retiring uh, either because of mandatory issues or just the evolution of business sooner than lawyers are. So going back to a comment I made about uh, this being a relationship business, uh, you know, it, it, it won't surprise, I think, any of the listeners to, to appreciate uh, if you've had a great relationship for 20 years with a general counsel of a particular client, um, and and you're relatively speaking of the same, you know, age bracket. Uh, increasingly, one of the things you see in the marketplace is that the clients are retiring, and in the same way that transition internally uh, from a retiring or a partner stepping back to a younger partner uh, is fraught with difficulty and uh, complication because again, it's a very interpersonal relationship. The same things going on at the clients works being you know, work and roles are changing and evolving to different people, and it makes that dynamic even more complicated. So, uh, you know, I think it's one of the things you're seeing um, impact the marketplace. Uh, there are an awful lot of uh, seminars and discussions. I was on a panel uh, for the professional liability section of uh, the ABA last year uh, with a bunch of folks, and, and the focus of our panel was on uh, transition, and it was you know, transition of client relationships, transition of leadership. Uh, you know, there are many firms, particularly those that are in the MLA 200 and, uh, you know, really good local firms, 20 to 40 lawyers, uh, that are all hitting about the same vintage, uh, usually 20 to 40 years old, usually founded as a result of a group spinning off of what was then a much larger firm 
for really good reasons related to more efficiency, better focus, all of those things. Many of them adopted, um, not intentionally, but unintentionally, sort of the same sort of compensation models around originations um, and certain levels of productivity. As a result of that, many of them don't, they have sort of a missing generation of partner because there was either not enough work to support that next follow-on group to become an equity partner or not enough leadership opportunity and transition uh, for people to get, you know, for, for the managing partner to, you know, shift responsibilities every couple years. It, you know, it's not, I don't think it's intentional, but there's a level of comfort. You know, it's uh, if it seems to be working, why change it? It lends itself to to perhaps a little bit of a complacency, and then you know, one day you wake up and and um, what I see in my role, we get an alarming number of uh, an alarming maybe an unfair word, but you know, uh, legal recruiters reaching out to us with you know really good firms that are uh, their lease is up for renewal. Uh, and most law firm office leases are about seven, 10 years, you know, or the managing partner or the biggest rainmaker is thinking about retiring, you know, two to three years from now and then looking around, they're not sure that they're going to be able to hold on to the business or they're not sure that they've got the right person to step into the, into the leadership role. Um, you know, but that's really saying something I think about the marketplace and it's, it is, uh, for all of the risk management and forward looking advice that we give as professionals how we operate and run our businesses tends to be a little more idiosyncratic uh, than probably the advice we would give if if our businesses were the client. And with you bringing up even, uh, it's, it's a good segue to a question I have, which is what are you seeing currently in the lateral partner marketplace right now? Really good question. I'll, and I'll answer that in, um, at a couple of different levels. So, you know, one is I've articulated, you know, there's a lot of movement in consolidation in really good law firms that might have uh, a local or regional reach. Uh, you know, they're firms that fall into the 10 to 40 lawyers. So they don't, they don't show up as kind of name firms in the MLA 200, um, but in any particular region in, in which you might be practicing, uh, you know, they, they would be the well-known local firm, well thought of, uh, you know, very deeply into the community. Those firms uh, what we see pretty consistently are those themes that I talked about. Client consolidation, uh, so where clients are looking for a single firm to pro- provide services beyond local uh, or sometimes even beyond regional, uh, and they're consolidating their client lists. Um, so, for, for example, um, most of the major insurance companies in the country over the course of the last uh, five years have substantially consolidated their, cl- their approved counsel lists. Yeah. Um, some of that as a result of mergers, banks have done the same thing. So, you know, that segment is consolidation, leadership succession, opportunities or challenges, and uh, overall, you know, leases up for renewal, some ambiguity about whether or not everyone who's currently there is going to be there 10 years from now. At the candidates who are coming from, say, AMLA up to about AMLA 150, but particularly those in the AMLA 100, Accelerated rate increases, particularly for those who service practices predominantly in the U.S. and predominantly either a subject matter that is, uh, you know, higher in volume or regions that may be non-major metropolitan areas, you know, like a New York City or an L.A. or San Francisco, you know, Dallas, Houston. There, your challenges are you have a lot of depth. And you have a lot of competition from firms like ours and middle market firms where, you know, where the rates uh, may be 20 or 30 percent lower uh, than what, what the competition is currently charging for what is really good legal work, you know, sophisticated, complex, interesting, you know, but nonetheless, it's really more of that regulated business compliance, things that are necessary like commercial litigation, but not bet the company work. And so, you know, there is a both a pain point and a uh, just a reality checkpoint. There is only going to be so much legal work in the world uh, that you can charge fifteen hundred dollars an hour to. Um, But, you know, the top of the market is really pushing towards, you know, north of a thousand dollars an hour. 
and for most middle market companies in the U.S., other than when they abet the company, uh, sorts of opportunities, whether it's litigation or M&A or IP, you know, realistically, um, it's tough. You know, that's just a tough place to be. Yeah. And then you have the rise of the digital world. So you also have folks who are really good local firms or regional firms who really are now able to project onto a national reach if they have the right platform. And, um, you know, those are the those are the three big trends that are that I would say driving that. And then, you know, there's a negative trend, which is law firms are increasingly focused on metric. They've always been focused on metrics, uh, but the amount of grace and time people have to adjust to whatever those circumstances are, whether they're achieving particular goals or whether they've, you know, they've happened to lose a client and now they're working on a plan to, you know, find a new client or, you know, it's getting a shorter and shorter cycle. So you also see the the tolerance factor, particularly at AMLA 100 firms, uh, getting ever shorter. And you see an awful lot of candidates, you know, where I used to see 10 years ago, you know, pretty predictably, the candidates coming from any kind of firm, partners would be billing 1,800, uh, 2,200 hours, uh, you know, rel- relatively consistent production, hopefully with a, you know, an uptick. What you really see is that the rise in rates, particularly at the world's largest law firms, the revenue is consistent, the working attorney revenue is consistent, the originations are consistent, but you can see a dramatic decline in hours. And if, again, if you look at industry t- statistics, I think it's really borne out. It's not to suggest that there aren't people at, at the world's largest law firms, you know, who continue to work at 25, 2600, you know, fill in the blank. But, um, but again, there's a, there is a segment of folks that as rates have gone up, the hours have gone down materially. And if you think about the implication of that, uh, you know, again, part of the relationship is the propensity you have to be doing work, coming into contact with your client, you know, being viewed as, uh, you know, the, the solution provider. And the fewer number of hours you're spending on that, unless you're compensating by other kinds of non-billable hours and conversation with your client, there's just that much less time opportunity to work with your clients to continue that relationship. And, and of course, the risk factor is, you know, if, if you become more efficient, but you've been able to raise your rate, and rather than handling three cases a year, you're handling one case a year. Uh, for that client, um, you know, and it may be really important, but that means someone else is still doing the other legal work yep. uh, that you used to do and that your relationship is, you know, one or two cases away from changing entirely. Yeah, there's something about the lower rate work that somehow gives you marketing face time, um, I think that you're alluding to. Yeah, that's right. And it's, but it's not lower rate um, necessarily. So, you know, for example, one of the benefits that I see in alternative fees and, 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 um, you know, law firm metrics, we tend to, every firm tends to focus on similar metrics. And that's not surprising because most firms are still vast majority of revenue is driven by the billable hour. So the rate matters, the billing percentage matters, uh, the number of hours matter, uh, and the collection percentage matters. You know, some of the overarching numbers that people tend to look at profits per partner, revenue per lawyer, you know, it's kind of funny because, um, uh, with laterals and and others, um, you know that's what people tend to focus on. It's really interesting to me though because most people, you know, those are all numbers juxtaposed with okay, but what's your overhead per lawyer? Right. You know, what's your profitability? Um, and so if I have segments of people who are entirely devoted to alternative fees, which which we do at our firm, you know, the hours are interesting. It gives you a guide to how people are doing relatively to something. Yeah, but the reality is if I have an alternative fee with a client where I know we're going to get at least a million five uh, for the year um, and I know we're staffing in a certain way, then, um, you know, I'm I'm less concerned about the hours than I, because I know what the revenue is going to be. Yeah. And, um, you know, the only limitation on that right now is, you know, alternative fees will probably be be somewhere between about you know, I don't know, 15, 20% of our revenue this year. And that, that means when I, when I talk about alternative fees, I don't mean discounted rates, uh, which is sometimes how, you know, people view that, you know, Hey, we have a, yeah. So, uh, but I think that's changing, but I, you know, again, I think that could be really liberating for the profession. Um, uh, because when you shift to that model, 
the hours matter because you want to make sure everyone is equally balanced in their work and the work's going to the right people and you need to understand how many resources you need, but less agony over it. I know that you were integrating quite a few attorneys in September from two different groups. And one of those groups, so one of them groups you had alluded to came from Denton's and the other one was a kind of a workman's comp boutique. Let's jump into the boutique and I think the revenue level was around $5 million and you felt like that was a good conversational piece around profitability. Can you talk about that a little bit, Eric? Yeah, sure. Again, if you're, you know, if you're looking at the traditional world, two different groups joined us um, in the third quarter this year. One group, very traditional from an excellent international firm. Um, its focus is the aviation industry. Um, and it, you know, they handle regulatory litigation, uh, corporate. Um, so w- really good talent. That is a traditional law firm group, uh, which does some alternative fee work, uh, but, you know, by and large is billable hourly work, very deeply engaged, you know, um, where part of the driver for that is we had a platform that would serve their needs, um, you know, albeit we don't have the international offices that their former firm does, but we have international relationships uh, with other firms overseas to, to partner with. Um, and, and so, you know, that's very, you know, what I would say is very traditional model, uh, the way any of the listeners would think about just a, a good practice group joining their firm uh, or to the extent they're in-house serving their client needs. Um, we were able to offer them some things that their former firm couldn't because our, uh, and, and, and this will dovetail around, you know, our uh, overhead, our cost structure, you know, our ability to have rate flexibility and and that just is is more significant um, uh, because because our model is is different and because we don't have all of those other offices. So we have plenty of offices, but you know, nonetheless, not operating in you know 50 different countries. Uh, and that's juxtaposed by the other group that joined us, which was uh, which is a workers' compensation group. You know, where traditionally, if you were looking at it just from a rate perspective, you would say, gee. You know, not sure that's terribly exciting. Um, you know, a very high volume, relatively speaking, low rates compared to the AML 100 or 200 marketplace. But what really interested in us uh, us in this is is sort of two two different things. One of which is uh, it was created as an offshoot of um, an insurance company and a TPA, third party administrator being dissatisfied with the solution they were getting, which was sending work to law firms, you know, in all 50 states and multiple places within some of those states. And it was very inefficient. And, you know, it was inefficient because, as you can imagine, if you're managing counsel in in 50 states and, you know, like in a place like California, several, you know, several different major geographies, um, it's really tough to kind of drive the same results to have people understand the business, there's just the inefficiency of of, of communication uh, with that many different people. And so um, the head of the practice was in-house and was charged with the task of coming up with a better solution. And uh, the better solution that, um, you know, after looking at the metrics and, and thinking it through and trying out some things, uh, wasn't to actually drive down the rate that was being charged. Um, but to modestly increase the rate to allow uh, the team to hire uh, the best folks to do the work. And rather than, um, as a result of raising the rate slightly, to lower the burden on each timekeeper of the number of hours that they then had to focus on. So rather than being focused on how many hours, uh, you know, are they going to record to something to to generate revenue, was really uh, the impetus is, uh, how efficient can you be? There's more than enough work to do. Um, so you could actually uh, hire, uh, afford to pay more. You could also drive down the total amount of work each person w- was doing by making a fairly modest change in the rate being charged for it. You could then look at commoditization and alternative fees, um, including how quickly an invoice gets processed. And then finally, uh, you uh, embed people with the client. So again, you take out a layer of both expense 
and a layer of communication gap. And so, you know, you place the folks who are the decision makers uh, on the legal side with the decision makers who are on the risk management side, and you turn that into a more efficient relationship. So, you know, if if you can, you know, if you think back to your experience of just communicating with a client at a distance, uh, you know, how many games of phone tag did you have to get to something? How many hours were wasted in that? Or how many email exchanges when, you know, if you're sitting side by side, you can make better, quicker decisions more efficiently as things change in real time, you're able to communicate those changes. And so, but the thing that really unlocks that is, uh, you know, it is using a completely different cost basis uh, by embedding folks with a client, by using different communications tools than that traditional law firm metric of, you know, everyone sitting in the law firm office uh, in an exterior office. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but, um, uh, cause I do it every day, but, uh, nonetheless, they're very different models. And what's interesting is you can get to the same or better profitability, uh, you know, using either model. And it's just a function of understanding the cost basis of it. So if you looked at the revenue per lawyer, uh, you know, look, there are going to be differences in the revenue per lawyer. But the other thing is the cost per lawyer in those practices when you operate them different are also fundamentally different and you can drive an equal amount of profitability. Um, you know, in the overall team. Oh, I appreciate you kind of just breaking that down and helping listeners understand how you guys are looking at that. Eric, I wanted to ask a question. What advice or wisdom would you provide to, say, an aspiring managing partner? Really good question. And I, I wish that I uh, had had heard a podcast like this. And, and it's personal, right? So, um, yeah. you know, what I'll, what I'll share is uh, may not work for everyone. That's one of the things that I've learned uh, we have an internal mentoring program that we've uh, developed that that involves one-on-one -on -one time with some of our senior executives. And, um, you know, what I've discovered in the process of both being a mentee in that program as well as being a mentor in that program um, is, look, what works for me uh, may not work for you. Um, but, you know, but having said that, let, let me offer up a couple of things, um, one of which is um, – if you've never been in law firm leadership before, whether you're a practice area team leader or an office leader, uh, you know, CEO, a department leader, whatever it might be, the first thing that I didn't realize is uh, how isolated you can become really quickly. Um, and, and by that, I mean, you know, I still have the same great relationships that I've had with my partners. I've been at our firm, LeClaire Ryan, since 2001. Uh, in my former role as the litigation department leader and, and even before that as an office leader and and uh, being responsible for some particular projects we had, you know, I, I have a, I've had a disproportionate opportunity to be involved in the recruitment of many of our colleagues um, and, and to have really close working relationships with folks. Nonetheless, even though I'm the same person I have always been, uh, once you assume a title and either responsibility uh, or authority over other folks, your relationships suddenly uh, and, and, uh, and silently begin to change. You know, so in my role as the CEO, I think it would be fair to say people are less forthcoming and open with me than they were when I was the department leader and then before that when I was the office leader. So so the first thing to recognize is you're the same person. Your title has changed. Your responsibility has changed. But, uh, you know, but your relationships have subtly changed, and you may not realize that initially. So you have to rely on, first of all, you have to know who your network is. So who are you going to rely on as an informal sounding board? You know, who are your formal sounding boards? Who are the people who are getting accurate information um, from folks uh, so that you can make better decisions than you would? Uh, so that's my first piece of advice, understanding what your network is, your support network, your kitchen cabinet. The second thing is really get to know the profession and the economics, your firm's economics, the practice economics, what's going on in the marketplace, because you may understand your firm really well, but if you don't understand the overall you know, ocean we're navigating in, then you may not see the tsunami till it's too late, or alternatively, you know, you may not see the wind coming where you want to change direction now 
uh, rather than when you're in the middle of, uh, you know, something more turbulent. And you can see ample evidence of that um, in the marketplace, uh, you know, with the transition consolidation of law firms, you know, law firms transitioning out of business uh, or law firms being acquired or acquiring others. So, you know, it is a turbulent ocean out there. Become a student of oceanography um, in our marketplace. The third thing is you have to have sounding boards. I've got a, a mix of people um, that I routinely talk to. Some of them are people who have been leaders in law firms who are now, you know, what what many of us, uh, you know, when I use the word consultant, you know, there's a, a sort of a disparaging note about that occasionally. But you need someone who's talking to other people. You really have to gauge uh, in a clear-headed way with people who are out there. I have a network of managing partners of other law firms, both a formal one and a less formal one. Uh, some folks who are at firms, uh, managing firms that are larger than ours, some that are in, that are smaller than ours, and then some right about the same size. And the reasons that I have that are because they can also see the winds coming in different ways sooner than I can. And um, so it just, again, it, it helps me in my decision making to see, okay, what's unique to us, what's not, how are other people coping with those changes. Um, there's there's no one central uh, matter. And then um, two last pieces of advice, um, and they're really brief. The first one is you have to have a personal philosophy. You have to be yourself in this role. So, you know, I think one of the hard parts when you step into law firm leadership is you're following in other people's shoes, and you should take the best of what you can learn from those folks. Um, but you also have to be your own person. You have to be comfortable in your own skin um, and bring yourself to the table. So, um, you know, I think one of the best best books uh, I've read, and I, I, um, I don't dwell on sort of the executive self-help books, but I do uh, look at them. But the best one I'd recommend to people is Know Your Strengths, uh, which really emphasizes uh, something that kind of runs contrary to the way many of us were raised as lawyers, which was to be a, you know an all-round excellent for a litigator. It was to be a great writer, to have great oral skills, you know, great client communication skills. You know, you think about all of the things you need to be great at. Um, but know your strengths highlights that the people who are among the most successful in the world uh, know what they're good at and energized by it. They also know either what they're less interested in or less passionate about. And they surround themselves with a team that covers those things that they're, you know, less energized by or less good at in this, in what you can do with a successful team is far greater than, than what you could do as a sort of a well-rounded, uh, what we used to jokingly describe in the past as a, as a renaissance wheel, meaning, you know, all things to everyone and doing them great. And then, uh, and then the final thing is, and, and this probably dovetails with my personal philosophy, all too often we get very hung up on numbers. So particularly partners in law firms who are looking at, uh, you know, whether it's revenue, uh, you know, individual performance metrics and statistics. It, and again, this go, probably goes to my personal philosophy. Those numbers are really important because that tells you how much revenue you have available uh, to compensate people. It tells you, you know, where you are on, on your client relationships, uh, the efficiency of those relationships, the, you know, but, but the most important thing about that is understanding those numbers are the result of a story. And if you don't actually understand the story of how those numbers have come to be, you're going to make really bad decisions if you if you simply react to things merely in a formulaic fashion. Because those numbers, which are down to the last penny, look very precise, but they are only relatively accurate. So they won't tell you, you know, who's decided to split credit for something uh, you know, you look at a particular 12-month period or a quarter, it won't tell you uh, in and of itself the fortuity of what client paid a bill early or what what client's going to pay a bill tomorrow, uh, who's dealing with, a, you know, a health issue or, a, you know, or uh, someone in their family with a health issue or, um, you know, some other kind of challenge. Um, and again, it's relationship business. And if you don't understand the stories behind the numbers, then you are more likely to make a knee-jerk decision around something that could cause you grievous harm because you don't really understand uh, how those numbers have come to be. 
And so, you know, we have a habit, I think, as a profession of looking at data in the same way that if you're a litigator, you look at evidence, uh, or if you're a, a corporate lawyer, transactional lawyer, you look at it as kind of deal terms, and you think there is a, a um, you know, you, you get very focused on it because those numbers look really precise. But if you don't understand the story behind those numbers, you could make really bad decisions. That is going to be just incredibly valuable to future law firm leaders. Eric, I, I know that you had mentioned that you have a, a history and a background in, and actually a double major in history and a minor in philosophy. Um, share a little bit about what you've been reading lately, any books you recommend, uh, biographies, um, that sort of thing. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and, and just to clarify, so um, I went to William & Mary. Uh, I double majored in history and government, uh, and I had a minor in philosophy. I, I joke up joke that I've been trained to be a stand-up philosopher, which would seems to suit the legal practice pretty well. <laughs> but um, but to give some context around that, so my focus in history uh, was uh, early American history uh, from uh, essentially the the mid 1400s um, to uh, about 1865, so just at the end of the Civil War, and in government was the origins of American political thought. So very much focused on uh, political philosophy around the Constitution, uh, the Declaration of Independence, and and sort of the early colonial thinkers. Uh, I have an, 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 an William and Mary, which is in Colonial Williamsburg. Yeah. Uh, just an incredible place to do that. Um, it's uh, where Thomas Jefferson uh, went to college, uh, you know, before he decided to design the University of Virginia. Um, <laughs> and and the, at the time, the philosophy department was in the Wren Building, which is the historic building in the center of campus. So, yeah, wow. so I'm really passionate about history um, and combined with sailing. So um, at one point, uh, I, I crewed on a tall ship. I was a counselor at some sailing camps, including one in which, uh, on the tall ship side, I had been, um, I crewed on a topsail schooner, uh, about a, uh, about a 70 or so foot, uh, two masted schooner, uh, made out of wood, just beautiful. And then at sailing camp, we actually had a 42 foot skipjack, uh, which is a legacy sailing vessel that's still used on the Chesapeake for harvesting oysters. Um, and is very distinctive to the Chesapeake. So, um, uh, you know, I like to walk history. I, uh, my family and I, uh, live on the original grounds at Mount Vernon, uh, just on the south side of the property. And our house is about 200 yards from George Washington's tomb. Oh my goodness. Um, and my drive, drive to work every day, uh, is that I'm in my office. I travel two to three days a week for the firm. Uh, but when I come to my home office, which is in Old Town Alexandria, uh, I drive up the George Washington Parkway, uh, really through about 250 years of history, uh, and uh, I drive by the original gate at Mount Vernon, the only spot on the Virginia side that you can see the house on the hill. Uh, and then, among other things, uh, and for a lawyer, this is kind of a geeky thing, so forgive me, uh, I drive across part of the grounds of Fort Hunt, and for many of the listeners probably um, uh, haven't heard of Fort Hunt before. It was a battery built to defend Washington during the Spanish-American War, but its real claim to fame was during World War II, it was where we kept uh, certain prisoners uh, from the Axis powers that we didn't want to disclose that we had captured. And so they uh, uh, included a number of U-boat crews because we had captured U-boats intact with their Enigma machines, and we didn't want to have to disclose that. And uh, there have been a couple of uh, books uh, ri- written recently in the last few years about that experience, uh, particularly dovetailed with sort of the modern experience of Guantanamo Bay, and so um, uh, which which gets to the reading part. So um, I tend to um, I tend to read a lot of kind of three different genres, one of which is historical fiction. Uh, so I am a, sort of a, a sucker for different kinds of historical fiction, particularly those where there's not just a novel, but kind of a continuity of novels where you can see character progression over time. So, you know, kind of if you think back uh, to the Hornblower series, if if you liked uh, seven, uh, 18th and 19th century, uh, you know, British naval uh, history or... Um, 
uh, you know, or what I'm reading right now is actually something that's a six, uh, six book series about, um, uh, someone serving in the British Navy and, and, and it, I, I don't have a particular fascination for the British Navy, just as there are a lot of, a lot of historical fiction comes out of Britain, but, but this one is about a naval officer, uh, in the late 1800s as, uh, steam is taking over from sail. And it's an interesting period in the colonial era because there's a lot of, uh, activity that's not really between the major powers. Uh, but the major powers are involved in places in South America and in Asia uh, and in Turkey and in and, and Russia and the wars that were going on at that time. So it's an interesting sort of political backstory as well. Um, second genre, I read a lot of science fiction. Um, uh, and in particular, uh, as, as Chris and I uh, have spoken about some time ago, uh, and to give you an idea, uh, so, um, for example, Dune, in the Dune series, um, so uh, you know, you some of your readers may have read parts of it. You know, there's an awful lot of books in that series now, including written by co-authors and and the son of Frank Herbert and, and and things like that. And what's interesting is I realized after a period of time that I had read everything as it had come out, and I had it on my Kindle, and I spent a summer uh, two years ago rearranging the books so that it goes in chronological order as if it were a history oh, that's of what was going on. Um, and, and, the, and one of the things that I think is a really interesting side note about some of the science fiction books, but the original book, Dune in particular, has to do with mythology and whether or not you can create your own mythology by understanding the narrative uh, and then adapting your life to it. So uh, you know, I encourage any of your listeners, if, if uh, they want to follow up with me on that, I'm more than happy to take an email uh, and, and talk more about that. I won't belabor it now, but it's a really interesting uh, philosophical question about whether or not the underlying uh, person who's the, the antagonist in it is truly fulfilling a destiny that's been predicted, or uh, do, do he and his mother understand the mythology such that they've then changed to uh, conform to that mythology? Hmm. Uh, which I think is kind of interesting. The other thing I'd say about that in, in walking history is uh, if you read that book and then you have the opportunity to go to Petra and Jordan, uh, you can understand that Frank Herbert was probably influenced uh, either by having gone there or by seeing pictures and, and, uh, uh, and designs of that because the description of the desert planet and the uh, opportunity to to walk uh, in Jordan from the entryway of this very narrow box canyon where it ends up at the treasury in that famous uh, National Geographic picture, or for those of you who have seen uh, Raiders of the Last Ark and the Last Crusade, uh, sort of where the Holy Grail is supposed to be kept is a is a building that's called the Treasury, uh, which is in Petra. But um, you know, so you can actually walk some of the ground, uh, which is kind of fun. It's fascinating. And you said that you use a Kindle. Have you always been using a Kindle? I mean, since it's been out? Um, uh, yeah, it's so funny. So I, you know, I have, I, I used to buy uh, maybe 20 or 30 books a year. And what I found with a Kindle, particularly for those of you who do Amazon Prime, I probably read about 40 or 50 books a year. Now, I have the advantage of, of being on plane, trains, and automobiles. Uh, a fair amount, and uh, some of those automobiles are driven by other people, so I don't read. Uh, although I, I sometimes do listen to books on on uh, on digital books while I'm uh, while I'm driving. Um, but uh, you know, so I have that advantage. Uh, but I was a fairly early adapter to a, to the Kindle, uh, and went through uh, the first two iterations of the Kindle device before I finally just turned over to the Kindle app. Um, but it really does open up the opportunity, particularly Amazon Prime. Uh, it's a really inexpensive way to add a very large library. Yeah. And um, what it allowed me to do at home, I still have a, my, my library space, my workspace, office space at home. Um, I've held on to all of the you know, hardback books, uh, things like that. So you know, I have some early things like a first edition of the History of the Confederacy, which someone gave me, um, which has some beautiful photographs in it. And you know, it's an interesting perspective. Uh, historical perspective, particularly if uh, you know if you've you've grown up with the other historical perspective, which is you know tends to dominate 
Um, but this was written in the late 1800s in um, the first person by uh, by folks. I think Jefferson Davis may have been the author or editor mm -hmm. um, at one point. Um, and then and then I have a lot of first editions from particular authors uh, that I like and that I've met or I had met over time. Uh, so, uh, you know, so I still keep that. I like the feel of having books. Uh, but frankly, if I'm on vacation or on a plane, um, the people sitting next to me are probably more appreciative than I'm not lugging a suitcase full of books or that I'm <laughs> blowing them as I'm turning the pages. Well, you're, you're definitely a, a man after my own heart. I'm a voracious reader and I love how technology kind of makes it a little bit easier. Um, <laughs> Eric, let me kind of close with a question, but I want to kind of tee up the question. It's going to be more predictive in nature. So, we see a, and it's it's political and world government related. So would love your perspective on predictions as populist movements have been moving through our country, through maybe France, through what's happening in Iran right now with lots of governments voting a new, I mean, it happened in Germany. What are some, in, in kind of in brief, if you can provide in brief, quick predictions to what you see happening across world governments right now? So good question. It's not what I focus on professionally, but having grown up in, in Washington and my father has, has taught tax law and international law at Georgetown for Law School since 72 hmm. and is still there. And uh, my stepmother worked on Capitol Hill for uh, Senator Murkowski for a number of years before she retired. And my mother is still actively in the State Department um, in the Office of Overseas Schools. So she's uh, responsible for helping to, run's not the right word, but oversee uh, for, for those of our uh, countrymen who are in embassies overseas who have children who go to the American school. Wow. Uh, that's part of her office that uh, that's sort of overseeing that. So that, that was a long winded intro. And, and I realized my answers tend to be fairly long. Let me see if I can make this short. One, I think we completely underestimate how the digital world is changing, how people communicate with one another all over the globe. And, and that's a two-way street because while there are increased opportunities for people to communicate, plan, organize, you know, foster ideas, share ideas, uh, there's also an equal opportunity for governments uh, to monitor that activity. And so, you know, my short answer is turbulence. It's going to be turbulent. turbulent. We're, yep. uh, yeah, we're in an increasingly regulated world. There is, uh, you know, whether or not you believe in climate change, <laughs> I think there's certain things that are irrefutable. There are more people every day. Uh, there are a finite amount of resources uh, so whether you're talking about, uh, you know, whether there's sufficient water, and I can't remember if it's Somalia or Yemen, um, but that may be, I think it's, um, I think it is, well, the capital may be the first capital city of a country to effectively run out of water. Hmm. So, you know, well, well, historically, may, we may think about people fighting for resources, you know, whether it's in the pre-World War II era of, you know, fighting for oil or uh, iron ore or, you know, steel, you know, or alternatively in the in the Gulf War era around uh, oil and oil production, uh, you know, or in the modern age, of, you know, technology and access to technology and resources around technology. You know, water, which is a f fundamental thing, is in fresh, clean drinking water is increasingly in short supply. You know, I, I don't think it takes uh, you know a genius to understand particularly if you've traveled uh, in the world and, and I think I've been to about 55 countries at this point mm -hmm. um, you know most people in the world are focused on whether or not they're going to put whether they have a job uh, today <laughs> whether they're going to be able to put food on their table tomorrow uh, whether their children will have a better opportunity uh, than they did and so uh, you know turbulence I think until we fully appreciate that we're living in a in a wider world. That doesn't mean that, that there's no place for nationalism because, uh, you know, I, I think part of the populist movement you see is in part driven by an underlying concern or fear around that. And it's very easy, again, if you look through history, it's very easy to see that there's a thin veneer of civilization uh, when there is a shortage of resources or the perception of a shortage of resources 
and the cry to nationalism or you know or religion you know particular religion or to uh, ethnic groups I, I think as a student of history uh, the thing that concerns me about that turbulence is it's uh, you know there's the view of the modern world that we've become more enlightened uh, but you know again whether you're talking about Rwanda or uh, in in Europe when Yugoslavia broke apart uh, or you know what's been going on in the last two years you know last several years in the Middle East between different religious groups or or um, even ethnic groups of the same religion you know sometimes uh, in scarcity that divisiveness that turbulence uh, that fear comes to the surface and so I wish you I, you know now having said that, I'm also optimistic about our future. I can't imagine a time where for many people in the world, including uh, people who one or two generations ago never would have been able to uh, travel uh, outside their region uh, or outside their country, you know, the opportunities to learn more about the world, uh, to actually experience and see different cultures, to learn from one another, um, and the benefits that come with that. I think have never been better, uh, but it is a more complicated regulatory uh, and regulated world uh, that comes with that. So, you know, that's that's the optimistic side. You know, the concern and and skeptical side. I think you know, born out of being a historian, is uh, you know, we have to manage those differences between us successfully if we want to be uh, to have a, a bright and successful future. Yeah. Yeah, Eric, and I think you've described that well, that you see turbulence coming, but you're optimistic. And so really, it's been an honor and a pleasure. I appreciate your time today and just sharing your insights with my audience. Thank you for your time today, Eric. Chris, thank you very much. And thanks to the listeners who have made it all the way to the end. Uh, I apologize that some of my answers have been uh, been very long winded. It's uh, a common complaint of my partners. But hopefully there's some nuggets in there that that your listeners will be able to take away and and uh, hopefully it will positively impact what they do in the future. Yeah, I'm sure it will. Thank you everyone who listened to the episode of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. If you have a question or would like to recommend someone to be on the podcast, please email them to podcast at findthelions.com. If you like the podcast, leave a review on iTunes. Also, please share a podcast with others via email or social media. To share a podcast, listen to more shows, or to read the transcription of this audio, go to liongrouprecruiting.com forward slash podcast. Thank you for listening to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. This podcast is for education purposes only. This content cannot be used for commercial use without written permission from the Lion Group. If you like this podcast, leave a review on iTunes.